So welcome to the 26th Hinsey Lecture in the Department of Physics at Oxford. I'm Stephen Smart. I'm the Philip Wetton Professor of Astrophysics, a position generously endowed by Philip and Roswitha Wetton, who are both with us uh, here tonight. Uh, and I'm director of the Hinsey Center here at Oxford. This is the 26th lecture in the series. Uh, and we are, as always, delighted to thank and welcome Lord Michael Hinsey and Lady Dorothy Hinsey here and uh, thank them for their generous support of astrophysics in, in Oxford. Uh, the Hinsey Charitable Foundation supports us here with six early career researchers, three DPhil students and three uh, postdoctoral fellows. And in the Hinsey Center, we're primarily focused on observing the universe on the largest scales, serving the sky in novel ways, whether that's in the time domain or at different wavelengths and new wavelengths. It's been a very successful year for us. Uh, two more of our Hinsey scholars, Peter Watson and Amy Knight, completed their DPhil uh, and graduated, moved on to new positions, and we recruited three new Hinsey fellows. Uh, Rob Fender was awarded a 13 million euro ERC Synergy grant, and Chiara Spiniello was awarded an STFC Ernest Rutherford Fellowship, one of the top UK fellowships for independent scientists. And so these lectures bring us together, uh, you students, postdocs, department staff, friends of, of the department to hear from a speaker with an uh, international reputation uh, for their research. And just before I introduce the speaker, I just want to advertise the, uh, the student, the undergraduate student astronomy society the Oxford University Space and Astronomy Society. It's back after a short hiatus. Uh, any undergraduates or postgraduates in the room, if you would like to join, uh, it's free to join. Uh, Shubham Kulkarni, the leader, the head of that, the president of this society, is here tonight. And uh, they have weekly stargazing, astronomy, and space themed talks. Um, and they're looking for members for the new academic year. So if you'd like to join, just go to this, uh, this website. So our speaker, it's a pleasure to welcome our speaker, Professor Laura Kreidberg from Max Planck Institute of Astronomy in Heidelberg. She's a world leader in studying planets that lie beyond our solar system and understanding the composition of their atmospheres uh, of these planets. And as you'll hear, ultimately this work aims to understand their composition, the structure of the atmospheres and the habitability of these distant worlds. Laura was an undergraduate at Yale and then completed her PhD at the University of Chicago. She had six years at Harvard as a postdoctoral fellow, including the prestigious Clay Fellowship at Harvard. And then she was plucked by the Max Planck Institute as a director in 2020, quite an unusual career trajectory. Um, if you know the positions as director of Max Planck Institutes, she is now in charge of a major initiative uh, called the Atmospheric Physics of Exoplanets Department uh, at Max, Max Planck, and she's gonna head up a group of around 20 young scientists. Uh, so using space-based telescopes, she's going to tell us she's detected water in the atmosphere of several exoplanets, detected evidence for clouds in these systems, and has been awarded several prizes for her work, uh, including the 2020 Andy, Annie Jump Cannon Award from the American Astronomical Society. In the department, we know Laura as a talented communicator. That's why she's here tonight. And the question of life elsewhere in the universe is something that certainly fascinates us all. So that's all for me, Laura. We are very much looking forward to your talk. And welcome to Oxford. Great. Thank you so much, Stephen, for this very kind introduction. It's my great pleasure to be here. Uh, before I get started, I'd like to give my, my biggest thanks to the Hinseys for enabling this lecture th series. I think that the science that we do is most meaningful when we share it, so I'm very happy to be here tonight to, to talk with you for about an hour about extrasolar planets. Uh, good, so the title of my talk is Copernicus Revisited. Is the Earth special? And I've been thinking a lot about Copernicus because this year, 2023, is the 550th anniversary of his birth. And so it's a good moment to uh, think again about the, the theories that he, that he used to revolutionize science. So I hope that most of you have had the opportunity to go to a dark place far away from light pollution and look up at the sky. And I, I don't know about you, but every time I have this chance, 
I am always so moved by the vastness of the thing that I am looking at. And so I think this really prompts the question, where does the earth fit in? Are we, are we special? Are there many other earths out there in the cosmos? Where is our place? And this is a question that has motivated humans for since the beginning of recorded history. Uh, scientists have addressed this, philosophers have addressed this, religious leaders have addressed this. Um, I'm speaking from the scientific side, so if you ask me any questions that are too difficult, I'm sending you down the street to the divinity school. <laughs> I know I'm staying in my lane here. So, um, one of the most successful theories of, of cosmology, so where Earth fits in, uh, came from Ptolemy almost 2,000 years ago. And I say successful because of its longevity. So this is the longest standing idea about where Earth fits in. Um, and this was a geocentric model of the universe. So Earth at the center, the stars and planets orbiting in spheres, uh, perfect circles around the Earth. And this was in keeping with Greek philosophy and thinking at the time that circles were the most beautiful, the most ideal form. And so, of course, the cosmos would follow sort of a circular pattern. Turns out this was not correct. Um, and, but it took until 1543 when Nicholas Copernicus came along and published his, his famous book on the revolutions of the heavenly spheres. Um, and you can see that this is a different model. This is the, one of the original sketches from Copernicus showing instead of the Earth, at the center of the universe, rather the sun and the earth and other planets orbiting around it. And this was a really spicy take in 1543. So this, this was so controversial that Copernicus's buddy, this guy named Andreas, who published the manuscript, put in an unsigned preface at the beginning, he wrote, these hypotheses need not be true nor even probable. If they provide a calculus consistent with the observations, that alone is enough. So he was basically saying, this is not necessarily right, it just happens to explain what we observe. Um, and so controversial though it was, it prompted a series of scientific breakthroughs known as the Copernican Revolution over a fairly short period of time. Uh, so next up was Johannes Kepler, who developed his um, famous laws of planetary motion, finding that the planets are not actually orbiting in circles, but rather in elliptical orbits uh, with non-uniform motion in the sky. Um, and he kind of you know, dug in his heels. He's like, finally, the sun itself will melt all this Ptolemaic apparatus like butter. So that was a, that was a 17th century burn. Um, then the next year, Galileo, uh, most famously, with his telescope, observed the moons of Jupiter in orbit around Jupiter. And so this was, with his own eyes, he saw something in the solar system that was orbiting a body that was not the Earth. He also observed the phases of Venus, the motions of sunspots. So you put all that together, and it, it's true. Ptolemy's model does melt like butter. And then it took a bit longer, but towards the end of the 17th century, Isaac Newton finally proposed a theory that tied everything together. So this was the universal law of gravity, that the forces, the attraction between objects is proportional to the inverse square of their distances. Uh, and with that, he sealed the deal. This was truly the end of the heliocentric model of the universe. Sorry, geocentric model of the universe. This was the paradigm shift to the heliocentric model. And that brings us closer to today. So this is the famous pale blue dot image. This is a picture taken by the Voyager spacecraft at the suggestion of Carl Sagan. This is when Voyager was 40 astronomical units away from the, um, from the sun, so 40 times farther away from the sun than the Earth is. And you can see in that little streak of light, there's a tiny blue dot. And Carl Sagan said this is like a moat of dust suspended in a sunbeam. And I don't know if there's any image that is more emblematic of Earth seeming so insignificant than this one. And not long after that came the discovery of the first extrasolar planets. 
So until 1995, there were no planets known outside of the solar system. Uh, but you can see in this timeline here, this is showing the number of planets discovered versus the year. There's been this exponential increase in the number of worlds known outside of the solar system. We're at now over 5,000. And Martin Rees, who many of you probably know, he's the Astronomer Royal, uh, I met him, we were like waiting in line at a conference, and he was asking me, what do you do? And I said, exoplanets, and he's like, huh, yes, uh, the Copernican demotion of the grandest scale. And, and I thought, man, I really need to work on my small talk. Like, I, I think, you know, if I, you know, if I ever want to be Astronomer Royal, I need to be a little bit more lofty in the things that I say. But he was, he was right. So this is, um, you know, it, uh, now we know that the universe does not orbit around the Earth, that actually there are many, many, many planetary systems that look just like ours um, around other stars. And if you break some of these detections down into statistics, what we've learned from the number of stars that we have searched, the number of planets we've found, we know that on average, every star has at least one planet, probably more than that, uh, because we haven't been able to search for the smallest planets or the most distant ones yet. We've also learned that small planets are more common than large ones. So planets smaller than Neptune are something like 10 times more common uh, than planets larger than Neptune. And perhaps most excitingly, something like 10 to 20 percent of stars host a planet that is somewhat Earth-like. And so the big question mark is what I mean about Earth-like. but. Um, for these purposes, I mean something that's roughly the same size and same temperature as the Earth. But let's break that down a little bit more. So, so what truly does Earth-like mean? What makes Earth a good environment for life to exist? And this is a very rich topic with many, many different opinions um, if you ask a biologist, if you ask a chemist, they'll tell you very different things. Um, but from an astronomical perspective, in very simple terms, uh, we think that having a solid surface is very important for the origin of life. It provides a stable environment for complex molecular structures to form. Liquid water is also considered extremely important. So water has very many special properties. It's a polar molecule, so it facilitates um, chemical reactions, it's a good solvent, it's liquid over a wide range of temperatures, it's good, it's a very good medium for forming the complex structures that you need for a molecule like DNA. Um, yes. Oh, and that's right. So another, another important point about liquid water is that there's a lot of it. So if you look at the most abundant atoms in the universe, after hydrogen and helium, the most common things that you get are carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen. So at the temperatures that you would get on a planet like Earth, that those oxygen atoms are going to be found in the form of water. And so if you think about what ingredients you have available for life to arise, water is a good bet. Um, and we, we think that it may be out there on many of these exoplanets. So if you observe the Earth as an exoplanet, this is the type of thing that you would measure. So this is a spectrum uh, of real Earth. This is taken from actually light from the Earth bouncing off of the moon, which is a really clever type of observation. And I've marked here different spectral features from the key molecules that are present in Earth's atmosphere. So you can see here there's ozone, that's O3, oxygen, water, methane, and carbon dioxide. And if you measure a spectrum like this for an exoplanet, you would know instantly that something was up. Um, because there's both oxygen and methane clearly visible in the spectrum. These molecules are known as biosignatures. We consider this the smoking gun evidence for the presence of life on a planet. And the reason this is so suggestive is that oxygen and methane are super reactive. So if you put oxygen and methane together, they react extremely quickly, form other byproducts. You should never see them at the same time. And so the explanation on Earth is that there's some constant source of production that is giving you oxygen 
and methane. The oxygen is coming from plants, the methane is coming from animals, and they have to be produced in abundance continuously, and there's no other explanation that we can come up with besides the presence of life. So the question is, now that we've found these 5,000 plus planets, can we find evidence for life on any of them? And I'm bringing us back now to a Hintzi lecture from almost 10 years ago. Some of you may have been here for this. This is Dave Charbonneau, professor at Harvard, um, who laid out a path for how we actually start to search for evidence for life on other planets. And he calls this the small star opportunity. And to illustrate why small stars are such a good starting point for our search, I've drawn them on this slide approximately to scale. Uh, so a planet the size of Earth is that black dot on the left. An M dwarf star, this small red star, um, is shown with the red circle. And then a star like the Sun is shown in yellow. And you can tell just by looking at this that um, the size of Earth relative to one of these dinky M dwarf stars is much bigger than it is relative to a star like the Sun. And so that makes our job of characterizing the atmospheres of the planets much, much easier. And not only that, but these smaller stars are the most common type of star in the galaxy. So sun-like stars are actually relatively rare, and most of, so it, that means that most of the rocky planets in the Milky Way orbit a star like this small red M dwarf. So that's where we're beginning. And now, what are we looking for? So I, I showed a few slides back, beautiful spectrum of the Earth itself with all of those features from oxygen and methane, carbon dioxide, water, ozone. I'm gonna step back a bit because this is astronomy. We start at the beginning. We have to walk before you can run. And so I think some of the first questions we should ask about these rocky planets are, do they have atmospheres at all? We don't know that. If you look at the example of the rocky planets in the solar system, you can see there's quite some diversity of atmosphere versus no atmosphere. Mercury essentially has none. Venus has a very thick atmosphere made mostly out of carbon dioxide. Earth's atmosphere is fairly nice. Um, Mars has a bit of an atmosphere. It's made mostly out of carbon dioxide, but it's only about um, uh, less than a few percent the thickness of Earth's. I'm showing, does anyone know what this, what this thing is second from the right, the kind of yellowish blob? Any guesses what that is? Titan, some of you know, <laughs> Ray knows. Um, so, so Titan is a moon of Saturn um, that has an atmosphere dominated actually by methane rather than water. And so this is another type of diversity that we could expect for exoplanets. And then finally at the very right, that's Pluto. And Pluto has a little bit of an atmosphere, made mostly out of nitrogen. It's very, very thin, it's very, very cold, it can collapse, um, but it still holds on to a little bit. So this is just a kind of, like, the solar system is a good place to search for inspiration for what to look for, for rocky planets outside. Um, the formation of atmospheres on rocky planets is an extremely complex process. It has to do with everything from the delivery of icy material during the planet's formation to how that material can outgas from volcanic activity over time to um, whether any atmosphere can be lost, it can escape, it can be eroded by high energy stellar radiation. Um, and the atmosphere can also be affected by the presence of life. And so the complexity of all these different factors interacting with each other makes it extremely difficult to predict a priori what types of atmospheres we should be looking for. And so this is, so I, I, I like to look to the solar system for some ideas about what might be appropriate. Okay. So how do we actually study the atmospheres of planets outside the solar system? And there's a couple ways to do it, but my favorite technique is to observe planets that are transiting their host stars. And so transit is when a planet passes in front of its star that causes a small drop in the brightness of the star. You can see here in this example, the larger planet 
oops, um, produces a deeper transit. So here's a smaller, more Earth-like planet. And then if you have something like Jupiter, you get a larger signal. And what happens during a transit is that a little bit of the starlight can filter through the planet's atmosphere. And at wavelengths of light, where the atmosphere is more opaque, the, atm it, the planet blocks more stellar light. And so it appears to be just a little bit bigger. This is somewhat analogous to, I uh, to give like a more relatable example. If you look at your hand, you can't see through your skin, right? At optical wavelengths, you can't see through. But if you take an X-ray of your hand, you see straight through the skin down to the bones. And so this is the same type of wavelength dependence where sometimes you can see through, sometimes you can't. And so by measuring the size of the planet in many different wavelengths of light, we can work backwards to determine the chemical composition of the atmosphere. Here's a nice example of this from Earth. So you can see it with your own eyes. This is what the Earth looks like in real color. You can see the moon in the background just for scale. Um, and a thin blue ring separating the Earth from space. That's um, caused by Rayleigh scattering in the atmosphere. It's the same thing that makes the sky blue. But if you move to a different wavelength of light, you see something different. So here's Earth in the infrared. And if you look carefully, you see where the arrow is pointing? You can see that Earth is a little bit smaller, a little bit more transparent in the infrared than it is in the optical light that our eyes can see. Now, if you move just a little bit farther red, you get something like that. Um, and that is because ozone is present in Earth's atmosphere and it's extremely opaque at this particular wavelength. And so this is a unique fingerprint of which molecules are present in Earth's atmosphere. This is exactly the same type of measurement that we want to make for exoplanets. And of course, it's much, much harder when your planet is dozens of light years away than it is um, if you are trying to do this from right next door on Earth. But this gives you the idea of what we're trying to measure. OK, is everybody with me? Yes. Good. I'm a professor in my heart, so I have to teach you something tonight. OK. So for the past maybe 15 years, we have been practicing this technique, mostly looking at planets that are bigger than the Earth. The larger the planet is relative to the star, the easier our job is. And we have gotten some pretty spectacular results. So this is the spectrum of a planet that's the same size as Jupiter. Um, you can see here, this is showing the size of the planet, so larger radii is up on the y-axis, and then bluer light is on the left, redder light is on the right. And you can see all this structure. There's peaks, there's valleys in the spectrum. And in particular, this, uh, I think you can't see my cursor, no. Um, there, the biggest bump is exactly what we would expect from strong opacity from water. And when I first started working on this topic, I was dumbfounded by this. I thought water was something that was so special. But actually, in the universe, water is all over the place, particularly at these lower temperatures um, where it's chemically favored. And so one of the things we've learned from these Jupiter-sized planets is that water should be expected. Um, and the, the only question is, can you get it onto the smaller planets as well? So this motivated a push to smaller worlds. And I want to introduce you to one planetary system in particular that is famous because it is so good for atmosphere characterization. And it's called TRAPPIST-1. I don't know if there are any beer drinkers in the audience, but this was, in fact, named after the beer. So the, the, these planets were discovered by a team of Belgians who maybe after a night of drinking were inspired, I don't know the story, um, but they named their survey TRAPPIST um, and happened to discover one of the most famous planetary systems in the sky. Um, and this is a system that has seven rocky planets, all transiting their star. It's very close by. 
Um, and the planets, and the star is extremely small. It's almost the size of Jupiter, this star, so 10 times smaller than the sun. And that means that the planets are more accessible than almost any others for follow-up to learn about their atmospheres. And they're quite close to their star. The innermost planet takes only about a day and a half to go around. But because the star is so much colder than the sun, it means that the planets are quite temperate. So the color coding on this figure, the green region, is showing what's known as the habitable zone. This is a region of, of temperature around the star um, where liquid water could potentially exist. So there's actually three of the Trappist planets that are potentially habitable. So of course, everyone was super excited to take a look at this. Uh, we turned Hubble at it almost as soon as it was discovered. Uh, and this is what we found. So uh, this is looking at the two innermost planets, planets B and C. Um, and here is, are the measured spectra compared to some models. And your eyes are not playing tricks on you. These are completely featureless spectra. They're consistent with flat lines. And that was, in a certain sense, not a surprise, because Hubble, as powerful as it is, um, is not big enough to see the most realistic atmospheres on these planets. Um, so a very extended atmosphere like that of Jupiter is something we could have seen. Um, but we don't think these planets have atmospheres like that anyway. We would expect a more compact atmosphere like we have on the Earth or on Venus. And so in a certain sense, this was, you know, we had to look, but we weren't expecting to see anything, and, and, and indeed we didn't. So this was back in 2018, about five years ago, and I was feeling really impatient at the time because I thought, man, it would, be, you know, it would be really nice to know if any of these planets had an atmosphere or not. Is there anything else that we can do? And so I used a different technique um, called a phase curve, and I'm going to illustrate how this works here. Let's see. So the idea is that if you observe a planet going all the way around its star, you can measure the climate of both the day side that's facing the star and the night side that's facing away from the star. And if the planet has a thick atmosphere, it's good at circulating heat from the day side to the night side. But if it has no atmosphere, you get extremely hot day side, as hot as possible. All of that starlight is absorbed and re-emitted back to space. Um, and a night side that is consistent with zero. And so this is a really good test of whether you have any atmosphere at all. And the thicker the atmosphere is, the better it is at circulating heat from the day side to the night side. And so back in 2019, very excitingly, there was a discovery of a new exoplanet where this technique was possible. It was accessible for this type of measurement. Um, and this is what we saw. Who thinks there's an atmosphere on this planet? Who thinks there's no atmosphere on this planet? <laughs> Who is abstaining because they are shy? <laughs> okay, most of you, I see you. All right, the no, and no one voted for an atmosphere. Okay, so indeed, there is no atmosphere on this planet. So what we're seeing here is just like the cartoon, you're seeing an extreme rise in temperature um, as the day, hot day side rotates into view. That drop in the middle is when the planet goes behind the star, and so all of the heat emitted from the surface of the planet is blocked. Uh, and then as time goes on, the day side rotates back out of view. And so... We are not seeing an atmosphere on the planet. Instead, what we're seeing is the surface, and it must be extremely dark to explain how hot the day side is. And we see very dark rocks actually on Earth all the time. Here's an example. Um, this is me and my husband, Andrew. Hi, Andrew. Yeah. <laughs> um, at Mount Etna last year, you can see how dark this rock is. This is basalt. Uh, this is something that forms from cooling lava. It's extremely common all over the solar system. 
And so we think that this particular rocky planet has a, perhaps a past history of volcanic activity that covered the surface with lava that has cooled off to the now very dark rock that we see today. So, okay, this was the picture as of 2019. We had looked at a couple of planets. We learned some that, you know, sort of inconclusive what we could actually tell about the atmosphere. We looked at another one that didn't have one. We need a bigger telescope. And fortunately, in 2021, on Christmas Day, there was the successful launch of JWST. Uh, you heard all about this at a, another past Tinsley lecture from Matt Mountain. Um, the very short summary is that JWST has been decades in the making. It's the successor to the Hubble Space Telescope, but 10 times larger collecting area, 10 times greater wavelength coverage, 10 times better spectral resolution, 10 times better pointing stability. It's the best telescope we could ever ask for. Well, that's actually not true. But it was a, it was a very good Christmas present in 2021. Um, and it has completely revolutionized the way we study exoplanet atmospheres. To give you an idea of a before and after, this is a hot Jupiter. Um, Back in 2018, one of my colleagues, Hannah Wakeford, measured the spectrum of this planet. It was just those two single points, those two blue crosses. Turned on JWST. And that's what we get. This is so extraordinary. I mean, we were just guessing before. We were doing the best we had with very limited data. Um, that huge feature, that's carbon dioxide. This is the first time carbon dioxide was detected on any exoplanet outside of the solar system. And the, it, one of my theoretical modeling colleagues looked at this and I said, I'm like, Paul, are you excited? Do you think this looks neat? And he said, no, it looks fake. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and, and so th this, this is now the capability we have, and it's very exciting to see what JWST can do for giant planets. That's not the focus of this talk tonight, though. What I want to talk to you about is what JW JWST has seen for the first rocky planets that it has observed. Okay, so I... <sighs> I wanted to find a way to, so I have opinions <laughs> about these planets. And so I developed an extremely technical tool called an atmospherometer, which I'm going to use to measure how close to Earth-like the atmospheres or lack thereof appear to be for these planets. So I'm going to give you a description, and then for each one, I'm going to go through about six examples and I'll give you my atmospherometer rating at the end. Okay, you ready? Good, so first up, returning to the TRAPPIST-1 system, this is our, our famous seven planets transiting their small star. Uh, when the very first JWC observations of a rocky planet was the innermost planet um, in the system, it's the hottest, so it's the most accessible to study um, and they observed the planet as it moved behind the star to measure the temperature of the day side. And this is the measurement. You can tell this paper was written in a hurry because this is not a beautiful figure. <laughs> but the, 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 the y-axis is showing cold to hot, so hotter is up. Um, and the data point is that black cross on the right-hand side, so it says measured 1500W. Don't worry about what that means. And I've marked as hot as possible on the models. And so you can see that the day side of this planet is just roasting. This is as hot as you could possibly get. And if you remember the, the cartoon of the planet going around its star, if you have any atmosphere at all, it tends to circulate heat around the night side and cool off the day side. And so this is looking like extraordinarily bad news for an atmosphere on this planet. My rating is 0, 0.0 out of 10. <laughs> this thing is a bare rock, sadly. I'm, I am on team atmosphere, but I'm a scientist, right? So I, you know, I have to put on my, my objective scientist hat, and whatever nature throws us, that's what we want to know. You know. If the planets don't have atmospheres, we want to know that as well. 
Okay, so moving on. We then looked at TRAPPIST 1C. This is my PhD student, Sebastian Siva. He's on the job market right now. He's wonderful. Please give him a job. Um, and he measured the same thing, so the day side temperature of planet C. So this planet is just one farther out from, from the star. Um, and it's very similar in its properties to Venus. So it's almost the same size, almost the same temperature as Venus. And so our first guess was, does this planet have a thick carbon dioxide atmosphere like Venus does? Um, and so we turned JWC, we pointed it right at this planet, observed it going behind the star, um, and measured this brightness, so this red, red data point with a red cross. And I've again marked the hot as possible line. And you can see the TRAPPIST-1C is a little bit cooler. And so that is better news for an atmosphere. This could be caused either by a little bit of heat circulating around from the day side to the night side, um, or it could also be caused by a little bit of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. We're seeing an absorption feature there. <laughs> <laughs> However, that, that said, it doesn't look like Venus. And so Venus has this really thick atmosphere. It would cool off the upper part that we're sensitive to with our observations. Um, and it would look something like this orange line that's too cold for our measurements to explain. And so while it's possible that there is a little bit of atmosphere there, it's not what we were expecting. We thought the most likely thing is this Venus-sized, Venus-temperature thing would look like Venus, but that's not what we found. And so this is a, a hint, maybe, at some of the diversity that we could expect for rocky planets, that even if you take something that is the same size, the same temperature as something we know, we're getting a different answer. So... My take on this planet is 6.2 out of 10. There's hope for an atmosphere, but it's not an atmosphere like Venus. Um, and it's not certain exactly what it's made out of or what its properties are. So this is, um, we've put in a follow-up proposal, fingers crossed that they, they go for it. Okay, next planet. Oop, ah. no, 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 don't, no, everybody close your eyes. Erase, erase your memory, that didn't happen. Okay, so um, next planet. Is, is also quite a famous one. This planet is called K218b, and it is in the habitable zone of its host star, so in the temperature range where liquid water could exist. So everyone is really hyped up about this planet. It's bigger, though, than the Earth, so it's about 2.8 times the radius of Earth. And that means that it must, it has to have an atmosphere to be so extended, to be as large as what we observe for the planet. It's got to be an atmosphere there. And indeed, when we turn JWC to look at this planet, this is the spectrum that was measured. And so you can see spectral features galore here. There's all of these bumps and wiggles. Most of these are caused by methane absorption. There's also a big bump caused by carbon dioxide. This is the smallest planet, the coolest planet, the only planet in the habitable zone where we've measured this much about its atmospheric chemistry. It got reported in the press as being potentially inhabited. And I would like to set the record straight on this. Absolutely no way is this planet inhabited? Now, let me tell you why. So the atmospheric features that are observed are so extended that there has to be a lot of hydrogen gas to puff it up. Hydrogen is very light, and it makes your atmosphere much taller than you would get for an Earth-like or a Venus-like atmosphere. That means that as you go deeper and deeper in the atmosphere, the temperature and pressure gets so high that you never reach a solid surface or an ocean. And we think, as I mentioned a few slides ago, if you want to form very complex molecules, you need a stable environment for that to happen. And so if you just keep going deeper and deeper and hotter and hotter, you reach pressures and temperatures where any complex molecule is going to be destroyed. 
And we think that's the case on this planet. And so even though it's in the habitable zone, this one is not habitable. Now, why did it get reported as being potentially inhabited? Well, there was this tiny hint of a spectral feature from a molecule called dimethyl sulfide, which has been suggested as a biosignature. I am squinting my eyes at the spectrum. Do you see where it says DMS, around 3.5 microns there? Does anyone see it? I don't. This is a, this is, a, let me put it this way. Um, statistically speaking, the chances of dimethyl sulfide truly being present in the atmosphere based on this data set is about as likely that it's gonna rain in Oxford tomorrow. So I'll let you take for yourselves what the probability is of that happening. Um, but I think the lesson to be learned here is that there is so much excitement about possibly inhabited planets that we as scientists have a very big responsibility to control the narrative with the press. Um, and so the, the discovery, of the, the paper where this spectrum was published was, was speculative. They said, I don't know, we'll look for some biosignatures. And they, and they reported what they found in a way that was fair. But when it got communicated to the public, the narrative completely ran away. And so people, you know, I have people calling me saying, did we find aliens? I have to say, no, I'm sorry. Like, it's, I, wish, I wish we did. But, um, but I, I think that we don't need to oversell this, right? Like, this is the first time we have explored atmospheric chemistry in a temperature range um, where we expect life to be forming. Whether or not life is possible on this planet, it's, it's exciting on its own. And so we, we don't need to oversell it. So if you're ever approached by someone saying, hey, like, did you hear about the habitable planet uh, so-and-so, put on your skeptical hat, please. <laughs> because I, I think the, for such an extraordinary claim, we need an extraordinary evidence, and this, this isn't it, not yet. OK, here's my review, 8.7 out of 10. Great atmosphere, but no surface. Um, and so this is not, if we're looking for something that is truly Earth-like, um, this ain't it. Next up, the first transmission spectrum of a rocky planet. So again, this is the measurement that's made when the planet passes in front of the star and you measure the size of the planet at different wavelengths. This is really exciting. There's a tiny little bump shown with the arrow here, right where you would expect strong opacity from water. So everyone got real excited. But it's not clear where this water feature might be coming from. Um, one of the problems with these small stars is that they're cool enough that the, there can actually be water in the star itself, not only in the planet's atmosphere. And so I'm showing here, there's cool spots at the top of this star that could have water vapor in them that would masquerade as the same signal that you would get from the planet's atmosphere on its own. And so this is a really tricky thing, right? If you go back to the spectrum, um, the blue model would be water from the planet. The orange model would be water from the star. And you can't tell the difference with these data. So I think on this one, jury is still out. <laughs> we'll put this at 5.0 out of 10 because we're remaining agnostic, but this star is on notice. We found similar things for um, another rocky planet that was observed with a transmission spectrum. And this one was a little more concerning. So it was observed twice. And in the first case, there is the same little tiny feature that looked like it could potentially be from water in the atmosphere of the planet. But then the planet was observed again. And the second spectrum is shown on the right. And you can see that those data points are completely featureless. So no bumps and wiggles to be seen there. And we don't expect the atmosphere of the planet to be varying. Um, this much, certainly not this much, but the star is rotating and has spots that are moving in and out of our, of, of our vision. And so it's much more likely here 
that the feature is caused by the star and not by the planet. So this one, the star is really on notice. This one gets a 0.2 out of 10. Um, probably no atmosphere on this planet. And finally, we even went back and observed, went back and observed the very same planet that I first showed you that was a bare rock. And we even see spectral features for this planet. And so that is really, really strong evidence that we're seeing contamination from the star rather than the planet itself, since we have an independent line of evidence telling us that this planet has no atmosphere. So we're back here at TRAPPIST-1b, 0, 0.0 out of 10. Come on. This is, um, we know that the star is behaving really badly here. OK. So the, that was the atmospherometer. I hope you liked it. Here's a summary, our scorecard, of what we have learned about these six planets that we have studied. Um, so we've got two so far that look like they have no atmosphere at all. We've got one with this very, very dark basaltic surface that we might expect from cooled off lava. Um, same thing for TRAPPIST-1b. We have three cases where the star is being really difficult, but it looks like if you correct for the stellar contamination, there's no signature left from the atmosphere of a planet. And finally, one with a hint of an atmosphere, uh, but not the atmosphere that we were expecting. So astronomers, I love you all. I'm, I'm one of you. We. We like to make sweeping generalizations from very small amounts of information. And I'd like to bring it back to Dave Charbonneau. This was his take on what we have learned about the atmospheres <laughs> of rocky planets. You know, Dave, Dave is Mr. Small Star Opportunity. He has sold this more than anyone. And now he's saying small, angry stars and the many godforsaken rocks that orbit them. So. Okay, all right, let's, I'm going to put my skeptical and my, you know, objective scientist hat back on here for a minute and say, look, we've looked at six things. Two of them are quite conclusive, no atmosphere. The other four, it's harder to say that we have no slam dunk evidence for an atmosphere yet. So I, I think it is safe to say that um, atmospheres are not incredibly common, you know, we're not seeing six for six where there's clear atmospheric features. This is only the beginning, though. So we have 30 more rocky planets that are scheduled to be observed with JWC just in the first two years. Um, this is a horrible screenshot of a giant spreadsheet I made that summarizes all of the observations that are coming up. Uh, JWC has a more than 10 year expected lifetime. And so we're going to clean up on these rocky planets. We will get definitive answers, even if atmospheres are rare, right? So if the answer is that only one in 10 has an atmosphere, that's the type of thing that we're going to be able to measure in the next couple of years. And JWC is not the end of the game. We also have a revolution, a revolution coming up in ground-based astronomy, the extremely large telescope is scheduled for first light towards the end of the decade. This is a picture of it under construction um, with the moon in the background. And so you can, um, this is a 39 meter diameter mirror. And we'll open up the way to study rocky planets that's completely different and complementary to what we are doing now with JWST. And looking farther in the future, there are also plans underway for a next generation space mission that would be capable of observing rocky planets in a completely different way. And this is used the direct imaging technique where you block out the light from the star and observe the planets in motion. Um, we can do this for very big, very hot planets today. And the plan is to build a next generation space telescope that can do this for Earth analogs, at particularly Earth-sized planets orbiting stars that are more like the sun. Um, where we can have an apples to apples comparison with our own solar system. So to conclude, coming back to the question that I posed at the beginning, is the Earth special? On the one hand, I think, nah. <laughs> you know, there's, 
There's more than 100 billion stars in our galaxy alone. Call it 10% of those have a planet that is somewhat similar to the Earth in terms of size and temperature that puts you at 10 billion potentially habitable planets just in our galaxy. By the way, there's also 100 billion galaxies. Um, even if 1% of those planets does have water and does have the right conditions for life, that is a number, I mean, even as an astronomer, I deal with these astronomical numbers all day. I cannot wrap my mind around how many opportunities that is for life. On the other hand, I think perhaps Earth is a little bit special. We're finding, you know, we've just started looking at the atmospheres of rocky exoplanets, and none of them look like Earth. We're not finding lots of evidence for loads of, of carbon and nitrogen and oxygen on these planets. And so perhaps Earth, while not unique, is somewhat rare. And so I say to Copernicus, take that. <laughs> maybe, maybe there's something a little bit special uh, to Earth after all. So thank you very much for your attention. I'm happy to take questions. Thank you, Laura. That was a great talk. Fantastic explanation about the about the transmission of atmospheres and and, and, and amazing data from the James Webb Space Telescope. Uh, we've times for some questions, both from the audience and online. Um, we've got two roving mic holders here to capture your questions. So we've got one on the left hand side there. Jay. Hi. This is hi. hi thank, thank you for the wonderful talk. My question is, are you worried about if we keep on looking at these rocky planets around M dwarfs, which, as you say, are just the easiest ones to look at, we keep on not finding an atm atmosphere, say, because they're just very irradiated? Are you worried that people will just get bored or lose faith in like wasting all this telescope time, or is it not a waste? <laughs> It's in my personality. So this is something I worry about. I think, I mean, I think regardless of whether the planets have atmospheres, this is something we want to know, right? If it turns out that none of them do or very few of them do, that is, an ex you know, that is an extraordinary advance in our knowledge of where we fit into the universe. And so, of course, like all types of astronomy, there's a bit of a stopping problem, like how many is, is many... Um, but there's dozens that we can access, and so I, I think if it's if if we want to measure the like occurrence rate of atmospheres at the one percent level, we've got to just keep going. And I think it's an important enough question that even if it is a little disappointing, if they don't have atmospheres, we still want to know. Yeah, good question. Yeah, that was a really interesting talk. Um, Possibly a dumb question on my part. You, with your phase curve idea, you're basically using the temperature equilibration around the planet as a proxy for an atmosphere. How do you know it's just not the planet spinning really, really, really fast? Uh, to... no, so this is a good question. So the, for the planets that we can make this measurement, they're so close to their stars that we expect them to be tidally locked. And so that forces you to have the rotation period of the planet synchronized with its orbit. Um, this is a good question, though. It, it just, by happy coincidence for us, the planets that we can make this measurement for, we're pretty certain that they're tidally locked, and so we don't have to worry about it. So I completely agree with you about the implausibility of a habitable water ocean on K218b, but 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 the uh, but uh, it is depending on water abundance, it's just barely possible for water to condense uh, into the upper atmosphere. So some people have proposed cloud life, and so what do you think about prospects for cloud life that's out there in the universe? Oh, that's a good question. I mean, I think the you know this better than I do, but. I, I worry about turbulence, where you know, if you really want some kind of stable environment, 
for your complex molecules to form, the extent to which that's possible in a cloud, I'm not certain. Another point against cloud life is that if you, I mentioned earlier that water is such a good um, medium for, for chemical reactions. If you're in the gas phase, then the likelihood of your, like it just slows down the reaction time enough so that it may not be possible to produce the complex um, components of DNA fast enough for you to actually get to a complex life form. So I have my doubts. I'm not a biologist or a chemist, though. So I, I mean, it seems more difficult to produce life in that type of an environment, but I don't know. I never want to be the scientist who says it's impossible, um, and perhaps nature is more creative than I am. Yeah. Say that again. Yeah, like a snowflake basis for your life. I don't know. Your, your guess is as good as mine. I don't know. Any other questions from, from the room? Yeah. Do you? So, thank you again for your talk. <laughs> This, this, this question I'm going to ask may be rubbish, but I, I read in Physics World about 10 years ago um, an article which suggested that producing life on Earth was crucially dependent on the tide, which was dependent on moon. Is that, do people still think that? And are you looking for moons around the planets you're looking at? No, so that is a good question. And I, Right, I mean, some people talk about the tides causing, you know, water to, like, flow over and away from, you know, giving you, like, this solid surface and, and a medium for chemical reactions and alternating between those. I, honestly, I, I couldn't say. Like, I, I think there, there are many different schools of thought about the origins of life on Earth. Some of them are, like, extreme Goldilocks, where they say, oh, right, you've got to have a moon, you've got to have tides, you've also have, got to have... Jupiter there is a shield from asteroids. You know, you have to have the right axial tilt. And there's other folks who just say, look, like if you've got enough water and enough time, probably you'll have these complex structures for me. And I, it's philosophically, I'm in camp two. <laughs> um, but it remains to be seen, right? I, I, th I think we have to just look at, at these planets to see what ingredients are available for life before we can even start to ask this question. So we've got one more here, and then we'll, we'll go online. Hi. Uh, thanks for the really fascinating talk. Um, so uh, the discovery of water on the moon is recent and fascinating, because up until 2007, the story was that the moon was entirely anhydrous. And um, you know, with the L-cross impactor at Cabeus Crater, as it turns out, in the permanently shaded regions, uh, the, the regolith could be as much as 5% water by volume. Um, it seems really funny that all of the rocky exoplanets have a 3 micron water signature, right? Uh, do you think that this points to a situation where water might be ubiquitous on rocky planets? Or... I think it's the star, man. I, I wish, I want to believe, I want to believe, but I think it's so much easier to explain what we're seeing with star spots, which we know have water, and then we know the star spots are there. I think this is just the simpler explanation at the moment. Yeah. Well, Alex, we've got one yeah. or two online. Yes, yeah, so this is a question from Stephen online. A planet needs to be not only habitable now, but stay habitable for a long period of time, maybe billions of years. How much does that restrict habitability? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, and we know that our own example of the Earth has changed very dramatically over its history. Um, there was no oxygen at the beginning. Um, I, yeah, this, this is a tough one. I mean, I, I think that it's remarkable that life on Earth has persisted over the vast changes in atmospheric chemistry and temperature over time. And so from an example of one, I'll generalize that it this suggests that life has a lot of staying power, that it's flexible enough that once it gets going, it can continue even over a changing environment. I mean, and that's not to say that there haven't been events that really dramatically affected life. I mean, there have been mass extinctions. There's the asteroid that impacted the dinosaurs. Um, but... 
if you once it's going, it seems from our single example, it seems like it can continue throughout quite big changes. And I think it would be great last question. What is your favorite exoplanet? I hate this question. <laughs> <laughs> this is like asking a parent who their favorite child is. It's un unanswerable. My so I think it's always whatever planet I looked at most recently, which in this case is the, the one that's a bare rock. And I've gotten really excited lately about, you know, if there is no atmosphere, what can you learn about the surface? What can you learn about the geology and the history? Um, so the, the name of the planet is LHS 3844B, but don't tell the other planets I said that. <laughs> wow, thank you, Laura. Um, this is such a young field still. Yes. I mean, the first exoplanet was discovered in 95, and I think then no one would have predicted the variety of solar systems that we've uh, discovered, uh, the quality of data that we're now mm -hmm. seeing. Um, and I think we'd, and no one here would probably be able to predict the next 10 years of results in this field. So uh, we look forward to hearing more from you and your group, the people here in Oxford who, who work in this, and it's a very exciting field for the next 10 or 20 years. So thank you very much for a wonderful talk.